This episode is brought to you by Roborock. Solar and wind power have proven themselves to be cost-competitive alternatives to fossil fuels. But to be a truly effective power source alternative, energy storage is key. While lithium batteries opened up the incredible potential for many of the technologies that we take for granted today, there are still some issues when trying to scale up the technology for the grid. Expensive casings, overheating, relatively short lifetimes, and battery cell supplies are just a few of the challenges for lithium technology. But what if I told you that molten metal might make a better battery? And no, I'm not talking about the end of Terminator 2, but we're talking about lower cost, simpler assembly, zero maintenance, and a longer lifetime than lithium ion. Let's take a closer look at liquid metal battery technology. I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. In a recent study analyzing the effects of the energy transition, the International Renewable Energy Agency found that more than 80% of the world's electricity could come from renewables by 2050. Solar and wind power could account for 52% of total electricity generation at that point, mainly driven by the declining costs and the spread of green policies. However, their intermittency is sometimes seen as an impediment and a knock against renewable energy, but on the flip side, it's also pushed interest forward for energy storage like never before. It won't be a surprise when I say this, but the most popular and widespread technology for energy storage is lithium ion. Shocker. The price of lithium ion batteries has fallen about 80% over the past five years. And they're the reason why electric cars like the newly announced Tesla Model S Plaid can accelerate to 60 miles per hour in as little as 1.99 seconds. That gives a whole new meaning to running to the store to pick up some milk. But lithium ion batteries aren't the most practical for storing hundreds of kilowatts or megawatts at stationary facilities. Not to mention they have a few safety concerns. The major hazard for lithium ion battery technology is thermal runaway, a cycle in which excessive heat keeps generating more heat. The problem can be caused by internal cell defects, mechanical failure, and damage or overvoltage that leads to those high temperatures, gas buildup, and a potential explosive rupture of the battery cell. Without disconnection, thermal runaway can also spread from one cell to the next, causing further damage. To add to that, a failure in the battery management system can lead to overcharging and the inability to monitor the temperature or cell voltage. And to wrap up the challenges list, lithium ion batteries are very sensitive to mechanical damage and electrical surges that can result in internal battery short circuits, which leads to all the previously mentioned issues. Now, it sounds like I'm bagging on lithium ion, which I'm not. They are great, but they do have challenges. So when you combine those issues with the still somewhat high cost of lithium ion battery and massive battery installations, it shouldn't be a surprise that there's still a lot of interest and in research into other forms of large scale energy storage technologies. One of those is liquid metal batteries. That's right, molten metal. But before I get to that, I'd like to take a moment and talk about another cool piece of technology from today's sponsor, Roborock. From talking about one cool piece of battery technology to another here. Now, I've been using the Roborock H7 vacuum for a while now, and it's fantastic. The one thing that's really impressed me the most is how long the battery lasts on a single charge. If you're running in eco mode, you can go for about 90 minutes. And charging up the battery is super quick too. Not to mention the really unique magnetic storage system for all the other brushes. It's pretty slick. I use the multi-surface brush the most. It's actually pretty cool because it auto detects the carpet and increases the suction. And it's surprisingly quiet for how strong it is at sucking up all the dirt and pet hair. It really picks up everything into a very large dustbin. Another of my favorite features is the bright OLED screen, which lets you know exactly how much charge you have left. And if you have any kids, there's a lock to prevent accidental use. If you're interested in getting the Roborock H7, which I've been very impressed with, check out the link in the description. And thanks to Roborock and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now getting back to liquid metal batteries, and just a quick refresher for how a typical battery works, they're composed of an anode, a cathode, a separator between the electrodes, and an electrolyte that fills up the remaining space. The anode and the cathode are able to store lithium ions, so as energy is stored during the charge cycle, Lithium ions move from the cathode to the anode through the electrolyte. When the battery is discharging, the ions flow back towards the cathode, which feeds the load. Unlike most batteries in which the electrodes and sometimes the electrolyte itself are solid, in liquid metal batteries, all these parts may be in a liquid state. Professor Donald Sadaway at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology pioneered the research of liquid metal rechargeable batteries using both magnesium antimony and more recently lead antimony. Now, this technology is composed of metal anode, metal cathode, and a salt electrolyte, all in a liquid phase. The anode is a low-density liquid metal that readily gives electrons, and the cathode is a high-density metal that's happy to accept those electrons. 
The electrodes are coupled through a medium density molten electrolyte that allows the ions to flow between the anode and the cathode. Imagine taking a bottle and adding a little bit of syrup or maybe honey, some water, and then some oil. And once things settle, you'll notice segmentation in the mixture in three different layers. This happens because of the different liquid densities, and it's exactly what we have here with liquid metal batteries. It's just liquid metals and not delicious syrup, so you really don't want to drink this. Now, because of the differences in density and the emissibility of the three materials, which means they won't mix together, they naturally settle into three distinct layers and keep separate during operation. The cell is loaded with layers of powdered anode, electrolyte, and cathode materials. When it's heated to melting, they naturally become these three emissible liquid layers controlled by their density differences. The technology was first proposed in 2009 based on magnesium and antimony separated by a molten salt. Magnesium was chosen for the negative electrode because of its low cost and low solubility in the molten salt electrolyte. Antimony was selected as a positive electrode because of its low cost and higher discharge voltage. And when it comes to the operation, liquid metal batteries operate like conventional batteries. During discharging and recharging, positively charged metallic ions travel from one electrode to the other through the electrolyte, and the electrons flow to the external circuit to supply the load. But you kind of have to prime the pump with liquid metal batteries. The initial startup of lithium metal requires external heating to melt everything. But once the battery is in a molten state, it maintains operating temperature by generating heat whenever current flows during the charge and discharge cycles. It's designed to be used daily and not sit idle for weeks at a time. Ideally, we're talking about like a five hour charge time, a seven hours idle, five hours discharge time, seven hours idle, that kind of a thing every single day. It's why this type of battery makes so much sense for daily renewable energy storage and use. And I know this topic is gonna to get a lot of comments about solid state batteries, but there are many pros of liquid metal batteries over solid state. They have a fast electrical response, lower mechanical stresses since the electrodes and the electrolytes are liquids, which also means there's no need for membranes and separators. This also improves the long-term stability, the usefulness, and provides lower cost cell fabrication when compared to other conventional batteries. Another reason for the lower manufacturing cost is because the materials used are abundant and cheaper than other materials. But I'll get to that in a minute. Like everything else in the technology world, this isn't perfect. Liquid metal battery cells are composed of highly corrosive components and have a high self-discharge rate for some chemistries due to the metallic solubility of the electrode in the molten salt electrolyte. Bottom line, they tend not to hold a charge for a very long period, and the biggest elephant in the room, and the one that you probably thought of during this tasty syrup explanation, the three liquid layers make the battery operation more sensitive to movement and potentially dangerous when the liquid electrodes touch, leading to a short-circuited cell and fleeting heat generation. Now, this isn't the case for all forms of the battery, which I'll get to in a moment, but this isn't something you'd want in your mobile phone, also because it's insanely hot, but it's perfect for stationary uses like grid energy storage. Now, although this technology has many advantages that could make it an ideal solution for grid-scale energy storage, it's a technology that's still under development. But when you talk about liquid metal batteries in commercial scale, the Massachusetts-based Ambry is the name that comes up. In 2010, Donald Sadaway, who's the pioneer of liquid metal batteries, together with David Bradwell and Luis Ortiz, co-founded Ambry with seed money from Bill Gates and the French energy company Total. They have 50 patents in the US and around the world covering everything from cell chemistry to manufacturing processes. This is a strong global patent portfolio that gives them a massive edge in the marketplace. Ambry's product is a ready-to-install DC containerized system complete with shelves of cells, weatherproof outer enclosure, thermal management, and battery management system. It's an ideal solution for applications that demand high energy density, frequent cycling, long life, and high efficiency. Cells are assembled into trays and connected with a thermal enclosure to form a megawatt hour scale system. The system is insulated and self-heating, so it doesn't require any external heating or cooling to keep the batteries at operating temperature. And the storage capacity can be scaled up by connecting an unlimited number of Ambry systems in parallel. The current system offered by the company can store from 400 to 1000 kilowatt hours, giving up to 250 kilowatt hours of power. Ambry's battery reaches over 80% of efficiency under a wide operation range, similar to lead acid batteries like you have in your car, which achieve efficiencies closer to 80 to 85%, but it's also considerably less than most lithium ion batteries that we usually see around 95%. During transportation, cells are shipped at ambient temperature and are inactive, which provides significant safety advantages during the assembly and transportation. And once it's delivered to the final site, heaters inside the system raise the cells up to operating temperature. And even though the system is expected to remain at operating temperature continuously for its life cycle, the cells are able to undergo dozens of thermal cycles, from room temperature to 500 degrees Celsius, without impacts on their performance. 
Now, unlike lithium batteries, Ambry cells are highly tolerant of overcharging or over-discharging and have a much lower rate of degradation. When a conventional battery is deep cycled, which means going from 0% to 100% charge, it degrades it rapidly over time. If lithium ion batteries are subjected to a daily deep cycle like that, they can lose 20% of their capacity in just two years. On the other hand, Ambry batteries can be deep cycled every day for 20 years and lose as little as 5 to 10% of its capacity. In energy facilities, deep cycles occur frequently since the batteries are regularly charged and discharged to make up for the fluctuations in the power grid. Ambry's liquid metal battery is made up of a liquid calcium alloy anode, a molten salt electrolyte, and a cathode comprised of solid particles of antimony. It enables the use of low cost materials and a low number of steps in the cell assembly process. But when it comes to cost, the Ambry battery is currently more expensive than lithium batteries. Still, as production technologies improve over time, the price is projected to come down. There's a cost advantage over lithium ion with the cost of the electrodes. The active materials are only $17 per kilowatt hour, while lithium ion is around $51 per kilowatt hour. That means Ambry based systems are projected to cost between 30 and 50% below the equivalent lithium ion systems between 2023 and 2030. Even after accounting for the aggressive lithium ion cell price reductions, according to the Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And just like all new energy storage technologies like this, Ambry is starting with initial demonstration systems. By 2022, they want to have one megawatt hour commercial system developed, certified and deployed for trials. And in 2023, their target is 250 megawatt hours shipped for commercial products. Kicking things off, they recently signed an agreement with Terrascale. As part of the agreement, Terrascale and its data center development partners will integrate an Ambry energy storage system in Reno, Nevada. There's already 10 megawatts of solar generation built into the site, which Terrascale intends to bring up to 500 megawatts. And there's 23 megawatts of active geothermal power with a rated capacity of 48 megawatts. Adam Briggs, Ambry's chief commercial officer said, the collaboration is underway and includes delivery of 250 megawatt hours of Ambry systems to Terrascale's first project in Reno, Nevada, starting in 2021. The Ambry systems are particularly well suited for the project's high desert operations, for the shifting of its large amounts of renewable solar load, and for its grid system peak shaving capability. With all of the liquid metal advantages I ran through, there are challenges since most current technologies operate at temperatures above 240 degrees Celsius to keep the metallic electrodes in a molten state, which can obviously pose some serious problems. In addition to the complex thermal management, there's also the concern about corrosion. Professor Guy Yu and his team from the University of Texas at Austin carried out a study on room temperature liquid metal batteries that used a sodium potassium alloy anode and a gallium based alloy cathode. According to the researchers, the metallic electrodes in the team's battery remain liquefied at 20 degrees Celsius, which is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the lowest operating temperature ever recorded for a liquid metal battery. The researchers have been working on this project for three years, but its work's not completed yet. Finding an alternative to the expensive gallium that can provide the same performance remains a major challenge. Overall, the cycling stability, the requirement for less maintenance, and the lower cost and availability for manufacturing provide a lot of room for liquid metal batteries to catch up for grid energy storage. It's expected to reach a market value of about $6.7 billion by 2027. It's always important to remember that there's no one technology to rule them all. Having more options like this can help with our need to stabilize energy generation from cheap, intermittent renewables like solar and wind. But what do you think? Does storing energy in molten metal sound like a good idea? Do you think it has a chance to catch on in the next few years? Jump in the comments and let me know. I keep having visions of the end of Terminator 2. <laughs> if you like this video, be sure to check one of the ones I've linked to right here. Be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell if you think I've earned it. And as always, thanks to all my patrons and to all of you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.